Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about the Silurian period, which took place between 444 and 419 million years ago. During the Silurian, we would see life begin to recover from the end Ordovician mass extinction. It would begin with a slow, gradual warming period in which life would begin to return to the shallow oceans. We would also see uh, the first appearance of animals on land during this period as well. So stay tuned while we talk about the exciting adventures of the Silurian period. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. In this video, we're going to be talking about the Silurian period from about 444 million years ago to about 419 million years ago. The Silurian period uh, would follow the end Ordovician mass extinction and begin with a fairly cool Earth, uh, but over the first, uh, first half or so of the Silurian period, there would be a gradual warming of the, of the Earth's climate as the greenhouse gas climate slowly began to return as steel began to reintroduce itself into the atmosphere. This, of course, would lead to the melting of the ice caps and the refilling of the warm, shallow seas, which are favored by life. Now, at this time, but we, by the time we get to the beginning of the Silurian period, we have seen that land plants have begun to establish themselves quite well in terrestrial environments. We see the four key adaptations that we see in all modern land plants appearing in these species as well. The alternation of generations, gametangia, sporangia, as well as the appearance of apical meristem tissue. All of these are the shared derived traits that are present in all modern land plants. But the fact that the shallow seas began to refill provided much more coastland and much more of these intertidal zones where the earliest land plants began to find themselves. This, of course, would be highly beneficial to these newly evolving land plants. As a result, it's not surprising to see that we begin to see these new terrestrial plants begin to diversify. And in fact, during this time period, we see them divide into three major groups. These are all considered to be seedless, non-vascular plants. They do not produce seeds for reproduction, nor do they contain vascular tissue, at least at this point. These three groups are going to be species that are very similar to modern-day liverworts and modern-day mosses. Now, these three species are united by the fact that while they do share all of the four key characteristics of all modern land plants, they are not going to produce seeds for reproduction. Instead, they are still going to rely on flagellated sperm to that, for reproduction. In other words, these sperm are going to have to swim through an aqueous environment to reach the egg for fertilization to occur. This helps to explain why the vast majority of these species, even in modern times, are still tied to moist environments. It's the only way in which reproduction can occur in these species. Now, to be fair, there are some species that have adapted to drier climates, such as tundra, and even in some cases, the desert. But these species are the minority of these seedless non-vascular plants. The other thing that's interesting about the seedless non-vascular plants is when we look at which generation is what we would refer to as the dominant generation. In the seedless non-vascular plants, such as mosses and, and liverworts, it is the the haploid gametophyte generation, which is dominant. In other words, when you look at a bed of moss, what you are looking at is the gametophyte generation. And instead, in many of these species, the diploid sporophyte generation is an entirely separate individual and, in fact, is often completely unnoticeable unless you know what you're looking for uh, because they are so diminutive in size compared to the, the gametophyte generation. This is going to change when we get up to uh, more modern seed-bearing plants in just a little bit. By the time we reach the mid-Silurian, we're going to see the first appearance of vascular plants. They're still seedless, so the appearance of vascular tissue in plants predates the appearance of seeds in plants. But when we look at vascular plants, we're starting to see some adaptations uh, to life on land. So vascular plants are going to have two major types of vascular tissue. The first is the xylem. So xylem is what's used to transport material from the roots up the shoots. So it's going to be unidirectional in terms of its flow, and the responsibility of this particular vascular tissue is to bring water, minerals, and nutrients up from the ground. Um, now, true roots don't exist at this point. I should note that those won't come for another few million years. But it's going to bring materials from the earth, up through the shoot and disperse it amongst the remainder of the plant. 
Uh, the other thing about xylem that's important is xylem is a type of tissue that can be lignified in some cases. And lignin is going to be yet another adaptation that many land plants have to terrestrial environments. Remember, the pull of gravity is significantly stronger when a plant gets to land. It no longer has water for buoyancy. So the ability for a plant to grow tall is dependent on how much it can actually resist the pull of gravity, yanking it back down to the surface of the earth. Lignin is actually a polymer that exists in many plants that give it that woody appearance. So when you look at trees, for example, the trunks of trees are highly lignified. Now, lignin is actually dead tissue. Uh, it's not a form of living tissue. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a polymer that helps provide rigid structural support. But the existence of xylem predates the existence of lignin, and it turns out it's the xylem that gets lignified by the existence of this polymer that allows plants to become woody and allows them to grow to greater heights uh, in terrestrial environments as they resist the pull of gravity. The other vascular tissue is the phloem. So phloem is actually bi-directional and it can move materials both up and down the chute. The major job of phloem is to redistribute resources through the plant. So for example, if we look at a plant that has true leaves, we're not quite there yet, but if we look at a bigger plant that has true leaves, it's the, the job of the phloem to take those photosynthates, the things produced through photosynthesis, and then distribute them through the remainder of the plant so that they can be stored properly or utilized properly. So the appearance of vascular tissue leads to the appearance of a group of plants known as the tracheids. And now tracheids represent 90% of all plants on the planet Earth. The earliest ones are going to resemble modern day club mosses and modern day ferns. So again, these are species that don't produce seeds, but they do have vascular tissue. And this is greatly going to increase their ability uh, to grow and thrive in uh, terrestrial environments as they're now able to more efficiently move materials longer distances, which wasn't permissible by seedless non-vascular plants. By the mid to the end of the Silurian, we're going to see the appearance of the first true leaves. And true leaves are a very important adaptation, as leaves are really these incredibly efficient structures that many plants possess that allow them to very efficiently perform photosynthesis to produce energy in the resources land plants need to succeed. Of course, the presence of conducting tissues, the presence of xylem and phloem, are essential for the evolution of leaves. Now, the nearest we can tell, leaves have evolved several different times in plants. Uh, part of the evidence for this existence is the presence of many different types of leaves. So, for example, uh, you, you have microphylls, which have a single vein down the center. You have megaphylls, which have multiple veins, which you see on trees, for example. You have stroboli, which are leaves that have been adapted to carry spores uh, or to carry seeds in some cases. Uh, so, there are lots of different different types of leaves that we actually see in existence uh, in plants and evidence suggests both molecular and anatomical evidence suggests that leaves have evolved multiple times. But again, the thing to reiterate is this, the appearance of vascular tissue was a necessary step for the eventual evolution of leaves. And as we'll see during the next period, the evolution of true roots was also allowed by the appearance of this vascular tissue. Now, while plant life was changing significantly uh, during the during the Silurian, we would also see drastic changes in animal life. If we look at what's going on in the ocean, for example, astracoderms, those jawless armored fish, are still the dominant species. But if you remember, towards the end of the Ordovician, we start to see the appearance of these nathosomes, these jawed fish. Now, while jawed fish would still remain a, a minor group of species um, in the ocean and not dominant by any means, one of the things we actually see is an, a, a unique set of adaptations beginning to appear in two distinct lineages. Uh, first, we would, see the, we would see these jawed fish diversified into two major groups, the cartilaginous fish, which would give rise to the lineage of sharks and skates and rays, and the bony fish, which would give rise to all other modern species. So we see the nathosomes uh, begin to diverge into two distinct groups, chondrichthys and osteichthys, cartilaginous fish and bony fish. Over time, we would actually begin to see these, uh, the bony fish actually begin to diversify as well into two distinct groups known as the ray finned fish and the lobe finned fish, but that wouldn't happen for a few more million years. Just keep an eye on those fish species for a little bit. Uh, things are going to change even more when we get to the Devonian in the next period. When we think, when we look at life on the the, the sea floor, uh, we're going to see that um, that brachiopods have begun to diversify quite heavily. Uh, the ocean shelf is going to continue to be dominated by trilobites, 
brachiopods. We see lots of crinoids beginning to exist down there. Uh, we're going to see sea stars and brittle stars uh, and lots of mollusks. So the nautiloid cephalopods are going to continue to diversify and dominate in the water column. The eurypterids, those sea scorpions, are going to continue to diversify and also contribute to the dominance uh, in aquatic environments as well. So we're going to see, uh, again, the ocean is getting increasingly more competitive, increasingly nasty as all of these groups begin to diversify and complete for dominance both on the ocean floor and in the water column. But all of this competition is going to have an interesting effect because soon we're going to start to see something by the end of the Ordovician that we haven't seen to date. We're going to see the first appearance of land animals. Now, they're not going to be land animals in the vertebrate sense. Instead, they're going to come from the phylum, uh, phylum Arthropoda. The first animals we see appear in terrestrial environments occur towards the end of the Silurian. And it's in the, the first fossil evidence we actually have is, is from a myriapod that is now known as Pneumodesmus pneumani, which appeared to be a late Silurian millipede. Uh, but what we see is we find it in, it, it, the type species has been found in, uh, in, ter in a terrestrial uh, rock strata from the late Silurian, indicating that by the end of the Silurian, animals had also made their way onto land. And think about how momentous this is. Just a, f a few tens of millions of years ago, there was no life on land. By the end of the Ordovician, we have plants making their way on land. And then by the end of the Silurian, we have animals beginning to make their way on land. And what's interesting is not that, not necessarily just that these species have begun to make their way into land, but they're going to change the land itself. If you think about what Earth would have looked like, at least terrestrial Earth would have looked like without plants and animals on it, you're looking at a fairly barren, rocky surface, basically sand and some dirt that just gets blown around here or there. But as, as plants begin to colonize the land, as, as animals begin to colonize the land, they are going to terraform the planet. They're going to be creating soil for the first time. They're going to be creating homes for other species. And eventually, as we're going to see, the earth is going to be terraformed, became, becoming a suitable home for many more species from which they probably weren't. This is a little bit of foreshadowing because things are going to get even crazier on land when we get into the next period, the Devonian. The end of the Silurian wouldn't be anything like the end of the Ordovician. We're not going to have massive climate change that occurs. There is going to be no mass extinction event. However, we would see three minor fluctuations throughout the, the Silurian period uh, where we see uh, some minor extinction events that occur. Uh, all of these appear to be tied to some type of uh, climatic changes. Uh, so one of the things we see, for example, is alternate, like uh, a rise and fall of the coral that seem to correspond with some of these uh, climatic changes. But no major mass extinction event is going to end the Silurian. Instead, we're going to transfer quite peacefully into the next period, uh, around 419 million years ago, which is the Devonian period known as the Age of Fish. And that's what we'll talk about next. So during the Silurian period, we see the recovery of life following the end Ordovician mass extinction. We begin the period with land plants beginning to establish themselves and then diversifying into three major groups. By the mid midpoint of the Silurian, we're gonna see the appearance of the first vascular plants in, in terrestrial environments. And by the end of the Silurian, we're gonna see our first animals make their appearance in terrestrial environments. In the next period in the Age of Fish, we're going to see how life on land continues to diversify and adapt itself. And we'll also see the first movement of vertebrates onto, into terrestrial environments. So stay tuned. I hope you learned a lot in this video. I hope to see you at the next one. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.